Okay, good afternoon and thanks for joining here. I was asked to, um, to take you on a little journey. Um, my name is Carsten and I'm the head of the physics department at the University of Liverpool. And actually the little journey is going to be quite a long one because it's going to take you a very long time into the past, 13.6 billion years ago to the beginning of time and the Big Bang itself. Um, I'm a physicist and one of the big challenges of physics is to try and understand the world around us and to make sense out of nature. And for that we need to have a look um, at the big picture and, and, and ask the big questions. And one of these questions is why are we here? So why can we enjoy this exhibition? Why are all the stands here? Because according to some of the most fundamental theories, at the beginning of time matter and antimatter should have been created to exactly equal amounts. And then sometime later, these particles, they should have met and they should have annihilated into pure light. So based on these theories, none of us should be here. And um, we are here, which is good for us. Um, um, but I think that that's one of the drivers of why we are looking into innovative solutions to push science forward. And I guess uh, behind all of this is one of the most fundamental questions that we all have since, since we are born. And that is the question, why? Why is the world around us the way it is and why does nature tick the way it ticks? Now, talking about the world around us, the point there is that the world around us isn't always the same. If we um, look back in time, some 5,000 years ago, people thought the Earth was a disk and some people in particular in the US still think that this is the case. Um, but um, about 2,000 years ago, we've learned that actually the Earth isn't a, a disk, but is a, a sphere. And at that time, people thought that the sun would orbit around the Earth. That picture changed only a few hundred years ago when there was the understanding that actually the sun is the center of our solar system and that there are the planets moving around this. And then that picture became bigger and bigger. And only 100 years ago, we believed that our, our galaxy and the universe are the same thing. Today, we know that there's so much more. And actually, what we do know is that out of everything that's out there, we only understand 5%. So to understand these very big questions, what we have to do is we have to go all the way back from the very large into the very small. To understand the world around us, what we have to do is we have to come up with innovations that allow us to look deeper into matter, into ourselves than anybody has ever done that before. Now this venue here is a perfect place to talk about this and also to get your views on that because that's where it all started. These three gentlemen here, um, Ernest Rutherford, Cockcroft and Walton, they, they all had Nobel Prizes for physics for their inventions and they were the first who said that we need to accelerate charged particles to very high energies in order to build super microscope. So some, some, some new technology that allows us to look deeper into matter than we could ever do this without these spe specific tools. And it all started in the northwest of England, um, in particular Manchester and, and Liverpool were the first um, accelerators in the world were born. Now today everything is a bit larger and the world's biggest accelerator laboratory is in Switzerland, in Geneva. So let's take us there. Um, CERN is an international organization. It's the world's largest um, international lab and it is a, a ginormous installation. What you can see here is an aerial photograph of CERN. Um, to the right you see Lake Geneva. This is Geneva Airport and the big white circle that is the particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider that is installed there. It is a ginormous installation, 27 kilometers in circumference, buried 100 meter underneath the ground with a single purpose to understand nature better. Now, um, in order to do this, um, what people have to do is they have ex to accelerate charged particles to very high energies. And I'm going to take you on a quick journey through the accelerator chain just to explain how that's done. It starts very simple with a bottle of hydrogen gas. Um, so you take a bottle of gas and you ionize that gas and you create charged particles. These particles, they are accelerated by means of an electric field, first in the linear accelerator, and then they go to several of these rings. And you've seen that on the previous picture. Uh, these are the small rings, the ones that almost hide away in that um, aerial photograph. And from ring to ring, you go to higher and higher energies. What you do is you increase the strength of the magnetic field in order to bend these particles on a circular orbit. You keep accelerating them and you get closer and closer to the speed of light. 
from um, the small accelerators you go to one which is already more than a kilometer in circumference, so-called super proton synchrotron at CERN, and from there you go into the world's largest machine, the Large Hadron Collider. And that really takes particles all the way up to the speed of light. So they oscillate millions and millions of times every second before finally they are being clashed together in these ginormous underground installations, the detectors that ultimately reveal the physics that we find in these processes. Now, how does that look like? Um, and that's where the innovation comes uh, fully into play. That is a picture of the ATLAS detector. It's the largest detector at CERN. It is um, a, a really big installation, the size of the Notre, Notre Dame Cathedral in, in Paris, but 100 meter underneath the ground. Um, all o every little bit here um, serves a purpose. Every little bit serves to detect a particle or the trace of a particle. And in that picture it's actually not complete because you wouldn't build such a detector with the center being empty. So right now everything in that picture is filled. Just for the purpose of scale, what they did here is they have removed the inner part of the detector and they placed the standard European scientist in here for scale so that you can get an idea of just how large it is. But what it is, um, what it is doing is um, the moment you clash these particles together you create all sorts of different fragments. Many of them will be known processes, but then there are some of them when nobody understands why they are there. So all of a sudden there is a, there's a trajectory, there is a particle that shouldn't be there because pe the theory doesn't predict it. And that's where it becomes interesting. Because ultimately every any physics theory only is as good as um, there's a new experiment challenging it and, and really allowing us to move forward. So we are trying to detect something which nobody has seen before. And these detectors allow us to do that. Now, the technological challenges in order to get there are enormous and they have driven innovation for a very long time. At the time when the Large Hadron Collider was conceived, nobody in the world could build the machine. Even if you put all the, m the money in, um, that is required on the table, there was just not the technology. So there was this vision. There was the vision of doing science that nobody has done before. And then there was the international drive to develop the technologies that were required in order to get there. So what you saw before, these blue tubes inside the tunnel, the dipole magnets that bend around the beam, they have a strength of almost 10 Tesla. So that's a very, very high magnetic field that at the time when the machine was designed or and approved, that technology didn't exist. So people really had then the mission to develop the technology in order to get the machine built. The second big challenge um, is handling the data. And the data that comes out of these experiments is enormous. It's actually so large that you couldn't handle it within a single institution. So CERN is not the place who's analyzing all the data. In fact, CERN is connected to an international computer network, the so-called GRID, that connects high-performance computing clusters all around the world, and everybody has free access to the data. You can connect to that data from your home computer, and everybody analyzes this data at the same time, all helping to unravel these trajectories and find the undiscovered particles. Now, that kind of computing ha had tremendous um, impact on society as a whole. Um, I think it's probably fair to say, and um, I, I'm not going to ask everybody to reach into your pockets, um, but I'm sure you all have the internet with you today um, via your mobile phones. Now, the internet itself was born at CERN. It was born because particle physicists at some point became too lazy to carry their data down the aisle and share it with their colleagues, so they invented a protocol for data sharing, and that was the birthplace of the internet. And what would we do today without the internet? It's, it's almost uh, impossible to think back these 20 years in time um, before everybody had this uh, with themselves. Also, the kind of approaches to handling that data, um, that is now commonplace in pretty much every area of science and society. So what started off as a challenge for particle physicists, namely to just pile up so much information that you are struggling to at some point analyze it with your own single computer and that you require to team up with, um, with groups internationally, you find that everywhere now. If you look at medical diagnostics, the microscopes that medical doctors have today, they are so powerful um, that the images they, that they produce can no longer be analyzed with a simple, simple computer. If you look at um, at traffic management, if you look at how big cities manage the traffic flow through the cities, these traffic flows are nowadays managed through machine learning processes. So, so the techniques that were developed for particle physics experiments have made it all the way through to real science uh, society applications. 
In um, Liverpool, we've just started um, um, a new initiative in uh, especially machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, a center for doctoral training on big data science. And that joins all of the different research clusters in our department, particle physics, condensed matter physics, nuclear physics, and accelerator science together with astrophysics, because everybody has the, sh the same challenges in their, in their research, namely handling huge amounts of data and making sense of it. So what we are seeing now is that the boundaries bef between disciplines they completely vanish and scientists are working together across academia and industry sectors across disciplines all with the same goal to make sense out of their data now you could say Carsten, that all sounds nice and uh, the particle physics aspects and the aspects into understanding nature better, that's all challenging and good, but really these are all um, scientific aspects. So I'm going to take this um, um, one step further and make it directly relevant to all of you. And um, I'm going to show you here on that uh, little picture, that is you. I'm going to explain why, why that is the case. So what is shown here on the x-axis um, is the penetration depths of radiation in water. And water, that's essentially you. 95% um, of you is water. And on the y-axis, you can see the relative dose, the energy that is deposited as a function of this depth. So from left to right, I basically approach your body, um, approach the skin level, and then I go deeper into your body all the way to 30 centimeters. So now imagine you have a, a patient that has developed a tumor deep inside the body, um, whether that is a brain tumor or prostate cancer in men. These are tumors that are very difficult to treat with conventional methods because um, you, can't, um, su you can't apply s surgery uh, typically with brain tumors and chemotherapy has a lot of side effects. So usually radiation therapy is applied. Now, when it comes to radiation therapy, you have a few options, um, and I'm going to just very briefly go through them. This first option, the, the yellow um, line, that is X-ray radiation. And uh, those of you who had an arm fractured in the past, they know that X-rays, they go all the way uh, through your body. So it's a radiation um, that can go quite deep or all the way through your body. That's not the problem. But what you see from that curve is that actually X-rays deposit most of their energies at the beginning, at the skin level. And the deeper you go, um, the, the less energy you deposit. Now, remember the aim, what we want to do is we want to kill a cancer cell. So what we want to do is we want to put maximum energy onto that cancer. So if that's 20 centimeters deep in the body, what you're doing here with x-rays is you're wasting a lot of your energy in the initial entrance pathway, at skin level in particular, and there's only very, very little energy that reaches the actual tumor. With electron beams, it's even worse. Um, you can see in the red curve, what you do is, um, again, you deposit a lot of energy at skin level, and then at the depths of only 12 centimeters, it stops already. So if you had a tumor 20 centimeters deep in the body, there would be no way of even reaching that tumor by using electron beams. Now comes our magic bullet, and that links directly to the uh, Large Hadron Collider research. And these are proton beams. So these are beams of charged particles, protons, that have a very different characteristics when they interact with matter. And that is that they enter into, th into the body of the patient and basically do not interact at all with the healthy tissue. And then at a certain depth, which is a function of the energy of the beam alone, they release essentially all of the energy. So that's what you see clearly here in that measured peak. You go all the way to 20 centimeters, and then you tell your beam, now release all your energy, you take out your cancer cells, and you also have almost no radiation behind the cancer. So it's that sort of magical bullet where you can take something out within the body of a patient without affecting the healthy tissue, without having these side effects. And that is um, an innovation, that is um, a new technology that has come directly out of, uh, out of fundamental research. At the beginning, when the Large Hadron Collider was started, or any of the accelerators, nobody had this in mind. It came only later, once the technologies were there, once the innovations were available, the magnet technologies, the imaging technologies, the data handling techniques, then automatically, more or less, also society applications came out. And if you have a look at how these medical facilities um, are working, it is exactly the same principle. You bring a charged particle to a high energy using a ring, smaller than the LHC, arguably, but, but uh, the same technology. You then guide it towards the treatment room, which is where the patient is based. And in the treatment room, you have some modulation of the beam. You bend it around a corner to get the correct angle to enter into the body. And then the, the patient doesn't see any of the accelerator infrastructure behind it, but they get the correct treatment for the type of cancer that they have developed.
Now, this is an animation, but this is very real. It is coming to the UK right now. It's a technology that has been used in other countries for a few years. You may have read in the newspaper about that little boy a few years ago who basically had to be kidnapped by their parents and be taken all the way to the Czech Republic for treatment. Um, that was, I think, I think that boy, the story of that boy was probably the game changer um, for the approach in the UK because he was essentially given up by the NHS. They said there's no way of treating um, that child anymore and he's still smiling today because that treatment worked. And that has triggered a change in the in the way that um, cancer treatment is perceived and there's one of these facilities which is opening up right now this month in Manchester at the Christi Christie Hospital there's a second facility which is going to open up at the uh, UCL Hospital in London there's one in Liverpool that is going to open up um, next year and there's four more uh, privately owned facilities that are going to open up in the UK over the next five years so seven facilities all built in the UK with a technology that say 20 years ago nobody had on the radar even to have that that level of society application and which that now will help to save thousands and tens of thousands of lives. It's, um, it's also something where the UK has a very prominent role um, and uh, the important thing here is that the medical applications are directly driving innovations in partnership between the academic sector, so the kind of crazy professors that have the, the, um, the ideas for where they would like to go, but then also the industry partners that can, them, that can pull them back to the ground and say, look, um, we understand what you would like to have and here's how we are actually going to do it. And I think it's that partnership that is required in order to make things work. So whether you look into um, health applications specifically um, or security applications, when you go to the airport nowadays, what you have to do is you have to stand on these two footprints and raise your hands um, and then an accelerator moves around you and the radiation that is produced by that accelerator checks if you have any dangerous objects um, with you. Similarly for energy applications, there are reactor technologies that are directly driven by particle accelerators. So all of this um, really has driven innovations in a number of sectors far outside of fundamental research. So what started as maybe questions asked by nerds had real society impacts o over time. Now, where I'm based, um, or my research group, the Cockroft Institute, um, which is a collaboration between four universities, Liverpool, Manchester, Lancaster and Strathclyde, on the campus of Darsbury Lab, um, we develop that kind of technologies. And what we are doing right now, and I think that's where your, your input um, will come into play, is how can we make that even more accessible? So how can we go away from requiring these very large infrastructures? Because you saw, even in the case of the hospital, you essentially require a building in order to create these beams and treat the patient. So how can we miniaturize particle accelerators? And here's an idea of how we could do that. short video but it had a lot of information in it so what ultimately limits or defines the size of an accelerator really what it is is the strength of the electric field that you can generate if you take two metallic plates just some distance apart from each other and you create a voltage between them what's going to happen is at some point you will get a spark between the two plates so if you keep raising your voltage there is going to be a limit where you can't go any higher because you will get that spark like a lightning in between the the, the, the two different charge states and typically that is of the order of a hundred million volt per meter so there's a very fundamental technical limit that you can't surpass because every time you try to go higher there's going to be this electric breakdown. Now, there is a place where we can have much higher electric fields, and that's the sun 
or any plasma. In a plasma, the normal laws of physics do not quite apply, and in a plasma, you can have much, much higher gradients. So the idea would be to create, a, to use a plasma to create a very high electric field, and then use that field for acceleration. And the way that we can do that is that we use a pulse of laser, a pulse of light. Let me just go back. So what's shown here is a, a, a flash of light which is going through a, a plasma cloud. And what's happening is that similar to a boat crossing the ocean, it creates a wake behind it. And that wake is synonymous for changes in the electric field. And in between those wakes, you have extremely high gradients. So if you then inject a charged particle beam in exactly these areas of the waves, you can, similar to a surfer riding a wave, you can ride the electric field wave use very high gradients and accelerate the beam much, much faster than you can do this with any conventional radio frequency accelerator. Actually so much faster than that, that there is a gain of a factor of a thousand or 10,000. So if you take the LHC 27 kilometers in circumference, using that technology, you shrink it to 27 meters. So you could have the LHC in just this area where we are all sitting now and do the same kind of physics studies. Now, um, one of the things that's important for research and innovations is that you have clear goals, smart goals, and, and probably the, the best known smart objective of all times is the one that is uh, related to the first moon landing, uh, because here uh, JFK basically defined how you define a smart goal, uh, because he said um, what we need to do is we need to take men to the moon and return them s safely to, to Earth before the end of that decade. And then in 1969, that's exactly exactly what happened. Now there was exactly that same kind of long-term vision by these three gentlemen that I've introduced at the beginning, because what they said at the time is what we require is an apparatus to give us a few 10 million volts, which can be safely accommodated. And that's a very important statement, because at that time, what people did to generate high fields and high gradients was that they were harnessing lightning. So they were literally taking a metallic rod putting it on a mountain and they were harnessing the, the power from the lightning and many lost their lives um, in that process. So safely accommodated in a reasonably sized room, again that's important because you, do you, you kind of have to be realistic in your dimensions and we also require the experimental infrastructure to do our experiments. And that was their vision statement and that's exactly what they did um, just a few years later after Rutherford had started in Manchester. Now, Eupraxia, that, um, that project that I've shown in the short video, has exactly the same kind of vision. What we require is um, um, a laser-based accelerator facility that can produce laser pulses with 100 femtoseconds duration, so a very specific number, an energy of 100 joule, which is very high, and a repetition uh, rate of 100 hertz and we want to build this in this next decade. So the same kind of smart objectives, the same kind of collaboration that is required between academia and industry in order to make it happen, and the same kind of spirit in order to set these targets for fundamental research in the first place, but then also expecting that this will have many applications also for society. So think again of the medical treatment facility, and if you wouldn't require that building to create your particle beam to treat your patients, but if that was just a small laser-based installation that essentially every hospital could have, an absolute game changer. Similarly for x-ray, if you could miniaturize x-rays, and we are looking into that as well at the moment, you wouldn't have to go to the hospital anymore to get an x-ray if you had a, a, a bike accident. Actually, the ambulance that comes, they could take the x-ray uh, wherever the accident happened immediately. Also, elderly patients who very often are struggling to get these diagnoses done, they could get the diagnosis done wherever they are, even at their homes. So in the case of Eupraxia, it's um, a European project um, that has only just started and we have that vision of, um, of building um, that machine over the next 10 year time frame. And, um, and that's a big mission um, and that requires lots of ideas. And uh, I think that's also why we are reaching out at places like here, because we need industry and partners outside of the core accelerator sector to, um, to collaborate with us. Um, if you are in any of these sectors, if you would like to contribute more, there will actually be a, a big event looking even further in the future because we are now asking the question what comes after not the LHC, not the upgrades to the LHC, which will be built in 10 years time, what comes in terms of particle colliders in 20, 30 years time. And again, right now we know 
Even if we would, would like to build such a machine, we couldn't do it because we don't have the technologies. We know we need even stronger magnets. We know we need to cope with data that nobody can handle at the moment. And right now we have to do the research and development in order to make that happen in two to three decades. So that's really defining our future. I'm talking about an installation that's going to happen when I'm getting close to retirement. So on the 22nd of March um, next year, there's going to be a co-innovation workshop um, open to industry, academia, free of charge, for everybody um, so if you um, are interested in that by all means do join us there's going to be also fascinating talks um, and uh, just drop me an email or click on the event page to um, register for the event um, I think at the end what I'd like to say is um, some of this looks like it's all already perfect and working and we get all the data there's so much still to be discovered. We are still far from understanding the universe in all of its, of its facets. I mentioned that at the beginning and that was not an exaggeration. We really have not understood 95% of the world around us, which I think is quite frightening given how much effort already went into this. So clearly we need new ideas, we need innovations, and to that I think we all have to contribute. Thank you. <laughs>